Okay, I think we're ready to go now. So good morning, everybody. Uh, warm welcome and thanks for joining us today for uh, to talk business ownership pitfalls. So thanks for choosing to watch our webinar on Zoom today. It's a beautiful wintry day here in Scotland. Um, so I'm John Moffat, I'm Director at Benson Wooden Co. We are Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors based in Airdrie, North Lanarkshire, and we work with many owner-managed businesses providing business advisory, accountancy, tax, VAT, bookkeeping, cloud accounting services and payroll services. Just to mention, if you're watching this in future, I don't normally look like this. The face, I'm doing the facial hair thing for November. Uh, so November uh, saves life, saves men's life in three areas. That's mental health and suicide prevention, prostate cancer. Actually, 10.8 million men globally are currently living with or beyond prostate cancer, and also the third one, testicular cancer. Uh, when we send a video link out, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll send a link to uh, if you want to donate to November. So on to our webinar after that, and it, it's, today it's called Avoiding the Pitfalls of Business Ownership, during which we'll be providing some free advice and some of the questions we get asked the most here at Benson Wood by our business owner clients. I'll introduce our panel. Uh, between myself and the panel, we've got amazingly over 100 years of accounting experience. Uh, so all three of the panel are account managers with Benson Wood. First of all, we have Bob Douglas, the permanently hairy Bob Douglas. He's not actually doing November, but <laughs> he's got the facial hair uh, just cut all, all, all the time. And then secondly, we've got the clean-shaven Chris Wilson. And thirdly, I don't be worried what I'm going to say here, but... <laughs> Last but not least, the longest, youngest-looking member of our panel, and Sexton. So, Thank some, you. Quick, some quick admin. There's a QA box for questions, and we'll answer questions at the end of the webinar. So, once again, welcome to our webinar. So, the agenda uh, for today's webinar is it's really a panel. Uh, so, first, uh, Bob, Chris, and Anna are our expert panel. And firstly, I'm going to ask questions of Bob on fixed assets which we get asked quite a lot. Next, uh, we'll go into Chris and I'll give him a grilling and what is the best way to be paid by your company. And then lastly, we'll just have some gentle questioning for Anne on director's loan accounts. So we'll move over to Bob first and we're going to talk about, firstly, what is a fixed asset register. So Bob, what is a fixed asset register? Thanks, John. Um, I think first I'll just define um, what an asset is. Um, it's, it's defined by accountants and, and accountants speak as um, a resource with um, an economic value that an individual or business controls or owns that's going to um, provide a future benefit. So uh, that, that kind of qualifies vehicles, plant that you're using um, to manufacture things, computer equipment, all, all manner of um things that you're using um, within the business that has a constant value uh, and is maybe used up over a period of years as opposed to something that's um, bought and sold for the purposes of, of making a profit. Um, an asset register to that effect then is kind of a piece of software or even just something simple like an Excel list that lists the, the, the company's assets, maybe gives details of when it was purchased, um, where they're kept, um, the current location, um, and allows them to, to keep tabs on the assets and compare the value of them uh, against their, you know, their accounts. Businesses can operate more than one type asset. There may be ones for specifically for computer equipment. There may be ones specifically for um, different departments within the business. But really, it's, it's just a list um, to some intent and purposes that works best for the business itself to keep tabs on everything. Yes. That's good. So most most businesses would have maybe one, two or three, one, two, three or four types of assets. So maybe motor vehicles, plant, fixtures and fittings, computer yep. equipment. So that, that would be detailed separately on the on the list. Yep. 
Um, and yeah, one of the things, Kenny, we, we, we deal with a lot is uh, we use zero software. And with that, we can automate the fixed asset register. And we'll come on to this next, depreciate the assets uh, automatically through the software. So that leads nicely on to the next question, Bob. What is depreciation? I'm sure we've heard that word a lot, but what is it? Yeah, I mean, we all know that when we buy a, an asset, for instance, a piece of computer equipment, after a few years, it's it's not worth the same as it was before. It's, it's worn out. New technology means it's not worth as much. Um, so basically, assets kind of wear down over a certain period of time. Um, some have different lifespans than others. Computer equipment typically is, is recognised maybe about three to four years. You may buy a massive item of plant that maybe lasts for 10 to 15 years. Your buildings, you'd be expecting them to last potentially a lifetime if you look after them. So, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's different types um, or different lengths that you would expect an asset to, to, to you know, ex exist for. Depreciation is really just a measure of that, and it recognises that your asset's wearing out over a finite life. So um, computer equipment, you may decide, if, if it costs you a £1,000, you may decide to, to write that off over a period of three years. So um, you're losing value of about £300 a year, basically, if you're writing it off over that period. There's, there's two different types of depreciation that's typically used. One is a, a simple straight line method where you would just apportion it, you know, £300 a year for a 900 piece um, of asset over three years. The other type recognises that um, it maybe uh, depreciates more, loses more value in the first year. You drive a car out of showroom, it typically loses about 40% as soon as you walk it, you know, take it out of the, the showroom itself. And then it kind of tails off as the, the lifespan goes. So reducing balance applies a, a percentage on what the value was the year before to write it down. So um, it's continually reduced, but there's always a value left. There is a method of doing that straight line where you can recognise that after three years, your assets may be going to be worth £100. So you write it off down to the £100 in a straight line method. But typically, depreciation is just a measure of wearing out. Um, it gets taken to the profit and loss. Good. And that leads us on to the next one. What is amortisation? Similar but different. Yeah, I mean, amortisation is exactly that. It's similar but different. Um, we covered really in the, the previous talk, I was mentioning things like physical assets, tangible assets, and assets you can touch and see specifically. Um, there are also um, an accounting term for intangible assets, things like patents um, that you may have, have, have taken out in a, an asset which you can't touch or formally see but it has inherent value uh, to the company as well. Amortisation just recognises that these have a finite life as well. And um, it's, it's a depreciation on intangible assets, as they're known, where um, we're just reducing the value of a, an intangible, like a patent or goodwill in the business over a certain amount of time as well. Um, brand, brands would also fall into that perspective. If you've got a brand that's, that's worth something, you'd maybe be depreciating that over a certain period. Um, period, but amortisation is the correct word for it. Yeah, good. And the most common one, you, and you mentioned it there, Bob, was goodwill. So if you're maybe buying a business or incorporating a business, there'll be a purchase of the goodwill of the, the, the previous business. And, you know, that's what's written off over a certain period of time because you're getting the, the benefit of that. So that's the most common one uh, we would come across as goodwill, but also the other ones that Bob mentioned there as well. So that's great, Bob. So we're now ready to move on to Chris. Um, and he's going to talk about different ways of taking uh, remuneration if you operate as a limited company. So Chris, first question is dividends versus salary. What's the most tax efficient way of taking profits from my business? That's one we get asked a lot. So... Generally, so it's a mix of both, and it's a case of kind of get, getting the balance right uh, for most limited companies. Generally speaking, for most kind of like mid earners, we've got directors, shareholders of a company, uh, we would recommend taking a salary either up to a national insurance threshold or personal earnings uh, amount so that you don't incur any actual uh, payee personal tax on it, and then taking dividends uh, over and above that. Generally speaking, we want to kind of just make efficient use of your base rate band for tax uh, without with avoiding kind of the higher rate tax. And generally speaking, that's the most efficient way to draw salary and dividends out of the company. Good. So that answers in a nutshell, but how, how are dividends taxed? 
So what you need to do when you're starting to receive dividends from your own limited company, you need to register for self-assessment, you need to complete a tax return, and the dividend tax rates um, are different from the the tax rates that you get uh, salaried on. So the basic rate tax for dividend is 7.5%, high rate is 32.5%, an additional rate, so that's really when you're a real high earner, you're over 150k, is 38.1%. Uh, these are going up from April next year, uh, thanks to the Chancellor, uh, by 1.25%. So, so it'll 8.75%, 33.75%, and 39.35%. Um, the, the other thing that can benefit as well is everyone can get up to £2,000 tax free dividends as well. Good. So that was dividends. So, anti salary, how much salary should I pay myself? We'd ask that a lot. So it really depends on on, on what, what you what you need, um, and it depends. There's a few other factors, especially if you're a startup company, because the if you if you need if you need profits to build up in the company to pay yourself dividends, then you don't want to take out too much salary. But it might be the case where you need to show a bigger salary for. Um, mortgage purposes or a variant th things like that. So, it, so it, 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 it can depend. As I, as I said at the start, generally speaking, for, for, for most earners, if you're a base earner, we would salary you between, somewhere between the national insurance threshold and the personal allowance threshold. Um, other things you need to take into consideration is your personal tax liabilities, because if you if you get all your income, it's salary, it's all taxed, it's source PYE, uh, more or less no need to complete a tax return whereas if you're getting the bulk of your income through dividend then you'll need to pay your tax payments in January and July each year um, other things to con consider as, as, as well it's going to slightly out with the scope of this but if, if your company's involved in any R&D work or qualifying work if you're spending a lot of your time on that to get added R and D benefit, you want to give yourself a decent salary so that you can you can get more enhanced expenditure on that. So that's one thing to, to bear in mind as well. Um, but to, generally speaking, we can hover most people around. I recommend that you hover around the national insurance thresholds. So the primary threshold where you would pay a bit of national insurance is nine five six eight. Uh, the secondary threshold. Where you just just avoid paying any kind of like larger sums in national insurance is eight thousand eight hundred and forty, and your personal allowance amount is twelve thousand five hundred and seventy. So it can also depends if you've got any other income as well, Chris. We would need to take that into account. So if you get any benefits in kind or any uh, other other investment or property income. Yeah, so, so we see, see that quite quite often as well, don't we? So we, we the minimum we, we put through is it's about eight eight forty, so that you can qualify for your state benefits and state and get your credits towards state pension and things. But you may have something you may you may have a car benefit, which we can come on to later. You may also have like property income. So uh, and then so you can make better use of your personal allowance that way. If some of your personal allowance is able to. Be offset against your property income, so you're mainly just taxed on dividends over and above that. Yeah, okay. I think you've seen one of the questions that have popped up, Chris. So, yeah, I think we will come on to that later. So, um, our next question around salary are there any benefits to paying myself a salary? So, I suppose that's salary as opposed to dividends. So, what are the, what are the benefits of taking it as salary? Yeah, so, so to, to take that on a wee bit further for what I I said just in the, in the last section, we want to kind of, uh, get enough salary so you're getting qualifying years and contributions towards your state pension and uh, maintaining your rights to sick pay and paternity pay and maternity pay. You need to consider as well, it's, it's all about timing as well when, you, when you're doing, doing your, your, like your business because you might be just just young out, out, out uni and want to go for a house or a, or a mortgage. So if the business is up and running, a lot of times, mortgage lenders will want to three, see three months pay slips, so you need to get show you you're earning a decent salary that way. Um, and also, over above that, this is like your, your salary is a deductible expense for, for the company, as opposed to debit. So there's no tax relief on, on dividends. 
Um, and just like I was saying earlier as well, if you're doing anything that falls within the scope of R and D, it can be more beneficial uh, with with enhanced expenditure claims to pay yourself a, sli a slightly more salary than, than you would usual. And we'd, we'd mentioned earlier about the, the rates of dividend tax going up by 1.25%, but that's also the case for employer and employers in IC, Chris. Yes, yeah, so for, for, for those approaching retirement age and facing, facing the prospect of a social, uh, social care bill, uh, us at the other end of the scale are going to have to be paying for that, I think. So we the National Insurance... <laughs> National insurance premiums have been at 1.25% for both employers and employees. Good, good stuff. So I think that covers what we were, we're hoping to go through uh, with regards to dividends and salaries. So thanks, Chris. So next on my list is Anne, who's an expert on director's loan accounts. So the question we all want to know is what is a director's loan account, Anne? Hi, uh, and thanks for the very generous um, uh, introduction, John. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. So what is a director's loan account? In principle, it's a very straightforward concept, um, but if not understood and handled, managed properly, um, it can become quite complicated. Um, every director should have their own director's loan account. And basically, it's just an accurate record of all transactions that happen between each director and the company. That, that, that's all it is. Now, if we take dividend out of the equation that's been paid, salary and reimbursable expenses, and there's no other transactions between a company and a director, we actually don't have a director's loan account or we have what is called a zero balance. But that is not normally the case in reality. Um, there is usually money put into the company by the directors and certainly money drawn out of the company by directors. So I'll give you a couple of examples of why a director may put some of his or her own money into the company. Maybe the company has got a problem with cash flow and they need a cash injection to help with trading activities. It could be that they have an asset they want to purchase. And certainly in this tax year, it's um, very advantageous to take um, advantage of the enhanced capital allowances at 130% to buy any assets that are coming to the end of their useful life, just referring back to Bob's topic. So that's a couple of reasons why a director may pay in some of his own money. Now, if it was just left at that, uh, the director's loan account would be in a credit balance and all is well. Um, the, the, the company has a creditor, uh, the director owes the company money and there is no complications, no implications and no problems. However, on the other side, we have the director who will draw money out. Now he may be drawing the money or she, sorry, um, they may be drawing the money out as repayment of loan they have actually put into the business or they may be drawing it, just drawing down cash to live on, or they may be using it, the using the company money to buy personal expenditure or use a company credit card for personal use as well. So then we have the balance of where we are, the credit balance versus the debit balance, and, and, and where do we tip? If at the end of the day we are in a credit situation, we are still, we don't have any problems at all. However, the pitfall, and this is what this topic is all about today, is when we are left with an overdrawn director's loan account and that we have drawn out more than we have put in. Now, what you've got to remember is when we're in that situation, so we have an overdrawn loan account. This is not personal money. It's not a normal loan. This is an asset of the company and it sits on the balance sheet in the company accounts as an asset. So then we have to figure out how we sort that problem out. Do you want to ask me any questions about that, John, or shall I just carry on now until to well, the... My question on that, and would be how do we sort that out? How do we sort that out, exactly. <laughs> so now we have an overdrawn loan account. So 
at this point in time, it's not the end of the world. You know, there is there is solutions, we, and we can look at what we can do. We can we can pay salary, we can accrue bonus, or we can pay additional or a final dividend at the end of the year. Now, if, if that's possible, then the problem can be resolved and we can revert that debit or overdrawn balance into a credit situation and the problem is resolved. However, if we are in a situation where we have not planned, managed, controlled our director's loan account, we can end up with not enough profit or reserves or basically money left in the pot to declare dividend to clear the director's loan account. And then we do have a problem. And that's when we move into the realms of tax implications. And the implication I'm referring to is section 455 of the company of, of Corporation Tax Act, section 455, which means that an overdrawn loan account, you have to pay corp additional corporation tax on that overdrawn amount. Now, just to be clear, that is on top of the corporation tax that is already due on your company profits. So if this can be repaid by the end of the year, if your loan account is cleared by the end of the financial year, all is well. If it can't, and that's the problem I'm talking about, if you can repay it by nine months and one day after the financial year end, then there is, you don't have to pay the Section 455 tax. Now, the rate of 455 tax is 32.5%. So if it's paid within nine months and one day, then you do have to notify HMRC that you have, you're in that situation and that is on the balance sheet in the accounts that you submit to HMRC, but you also note that it is paid within the allotted time scale. However, if we cannot pay within the nine months and one day, then you have to pay the section 455 tax. Now, that is, you can see already, things have spiralled out of control because we have not properly managed and accounted for our director's own account. And we're back to the situation where we have cash flow problems because we're paying additional tax, corporation tax. Now, although this tax can be reclaimed once the loan account is paid off, it's a lengthy process, interest is accrued on that, and it's a situation that we need to avoid at all costs. Yeah, so uh, a bit of a horror story there, you paint, paint Anne, and uh, I think one of the other things to consider is if the loan is over 10,000, the overdrawn loan is over £10,000, is there an additional complication? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, definitely. And and that can occur, that's not just at the end of the year. If HMRC are aware that at any time throughout the year that you're, you're uh, loan account is overdrawn by more than £10,000, then they will deem that to be a benefit in kind. And then we get into the realms of P11Ds and you have to, and the individual director will have to declare this on their personal tax return and the company is liable for Class 1 e national insurance. So I'm using the word spiralling, lack of control, spiralling out of control and additional tax and interest to pay. Yeah. So n never, never, ever take large sums of money without speaking to your accountant. Yeah. Always keep control of your director's loan account. And please, please, please do not use it like a personal account to do your shopping or whatever. Do not let that happen because that's when you lose control. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, the important things um, from that point of view are, yeah, as Anne says, the companies are separate entity. The company's money is the company's money, and you shouldn't treat the company as a personal bank account. Um, the other thing we are helping a lot of clients with is uh, by having them on uh, cloud accounting software and monitoring their current figures with them. We can prevent this kind of situation arising. So where possible, we don't have any overdrawn loan accounts and things are in control and are not spiralling out of control, as, as Anne had mentioned there in, in that scenario. So 
Thanks very much, Anne. That was uh, great. Yeah, and, th and thank you, John. But I just, just one thing to say. I've been talking about spiralling and avoiding, but um, it's all about um, how to solve it. And as you say, speak to speak to us, speak to your accountants, and and keep in touch with us on a monthly, quarterly, at least um, twice a year basis, so we can manage and advise and and avoid these pitfalls happening. So thank you for your time today. Great. So we're on to thanks very much to all three of you for for answering these questions. So. So fully, and uh, to Anne for putting the fear of death into everybody. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Good. We need to tell the truth. So um, well, just to see if there's any questions, and we've got one from an anonymous attendee, so Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, and this is the one that Chris spotted earlier, and it's what are the implications of a company taking a car over a salary? So if the, the, I suppose the question is uh, if the company... Uh, pays for a, a director's car as opposed to as opposed to uh, some of the the, the salary uh, salary payments. So, Chris, there's implications of that. Depends on the car. Is the kind of short answer to, 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 to that one, John? Um, so, I mean, I mean, these days, uh, and certainly for the last few years, we would never recommend taking on like a traditional petrol or diesel car as a company car uh, because the benefits in kind are, are, are too, too high uh, even making use of you know, like salary sacrifice which I'll explain the mechanics of that working at the moment the, a few but if you, if you get a, a, a petrol or diesel car the benefit in kind rate I imagine it is likely to be somewhere between at least 20 and 30 percent um, and you'll be taxed a, a significant sum on that and the company needs to pay employers national insurance on that too and it's very inefficient um, very different if you're looking at the electrics and hybrids which uh, the kind of car manufacturers are making now uh, because a lot of these can be very tax efficient uh, and it, is, it can be very worthwhile to go down the salary sacrifice route so basically what, what that means is if you can basically give up a portion of your salary uh, to cover the the cost of your your, your car, and how that works is you, you save a bit of payway national insurance that way, but your benefit in kind can be payrolled, so that you you get taxed. So you you pay the, the tax and and that's due on your your car benefit is paid monthly. Um, but that can be, be good as a few traditional can you pay your car if you've got like an HP. Or even a lease, and you've got a monthly payment of two, three, four hundred pounds. So instead of paying that direct to the the lease company, then it's basically just it's a deduction off the wage, and you're getting getting as a, as, a, as a company car. Yeah, and it, it can be very efficient to do that. Certainly for for the electrics and the the, the hybrids that I've got can a good range of over like 130 miles. Um, there can be the benefits and kinds are relatively low, so it's worthwhile doing these over the next few years, and the company can get good good tax relief on both the the cost of the car if they're buying them or if they're leasing them, and the company can also get a uh, fifty percent of the the VAT where that's a lease as well. It's a lot, lot of information here. Thank, thanks, Chris. And, and, and somebody. Probably don't put a car through the company unless it's electric or a longer range hybrid. Uh, and in these cases, it's well worth considering. So speak to us if you uh, need any advice on that. And we've got another anonymous question from the first section. Uh, can you summarise what incentives there are at the moment for buying assets? So that was Bob, I think, was the first section. So... Capital allowances and assets, Bob. Thanks, John. Um, I already touched on this. She, she mentioned um, a 130% rate. That, that's probably the principal one. Um, and in the wake of COVID, uh, the Chancellor was noticing that uh, the, the amount that people were investing in assets for the business had, had obviously gone, gone down significantly because people were, were feeling strapped and businesses were feeling strapped for cash. Since the 1st of April, 2021 and it runs for two years up to the, the 31st of March 2023 
Um, the government has introduced what they've called a super deduction uh, for qualifying items of plant, whereby you can claim 130% um, first year relief on any purchases of, uh, as I say, qualifying plant and expenditure. This is a significant improvement on, on the position where we were before, whereby we would have um, an allowable deduction in the first year up to a million pounds of 100%. A, a, a straightforward example, um, and I'm just, just plucking round numbers because I can work them out in my fingers, is if, 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 a, if a company was to spend, say, 10 million um, on a qualifying plant, um, under the old regime, one million of that would be deductible at 100%, and then nine million would be deductible at the, the, the written down allowance rate of 18%. So typically, they would get about uh, 2.6 million of deductions that would be deductible at 19%. <laughs> under the new regime, this whole 10 million pounds that they would be investing will get a 130% deduction. So you get a 13 million deduction in the first year. Um, you can see that numbers stack up uh, quite considerably. Um, 13 million at 19% um, works out about two and a half million. So you're, you're getting a first year tax saving under the new regime if you were to spend 10 million in assets of two and a half million compared to about half a million before under the old system. And obviously it's, it's down to being able to afford the assets. Don't, don't just go out and <laughs> throw, throw the cash around if, you, if you've not got it there. But um, if you were planning on buying assets and plant machinery, this is a fantastic opportunity and a fantastic time to be looking at doing that. Um, like I say, it runs from the 1st of April 2021 up until the 31st of March 2023. Okay, that's great, Bob. Thanks for answering that one. So I think that's us done. So uh, thanks again to our panellists. And uh, as I say, we'll send out a link to this shortly and we'll be back next probably in January for our, our, our next webinar. So thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.